Julian Albuquerque. I'm the director of the Brazil Initiative of the uh, University. And uh, uh, welcome to everyone. Uh, usually I say that this is our first event of the, of the year, but it's, uh, we're having it a little late th this fall, so it's no longer the first uh, event. Uh, we've already had at least one. Uh, and uh, we have upcoming events uh, both in October and November. And I take the opportunity to invite you to visit the site of the initiative. It's very easy. It's just Brazil with a Z dot W-I-S-T dot E-D-U. Uh, and there you can click on events. You can also click on uh, Joaquin Abuku Award uh, and, uh, and learn about this exciting uh, annual award that we have every year for the best essay uh, essays written uh, on campus that school year uh, on any aspect of Brazil, uh, any field. Uh, and there is an undergraduate version and a graduate version, and uh, each one of the two carries a $2,000 award. So it's something to, uh, to think about. Uh, this is already the fifth edition. Uh, it's hard to believe, but it is the fifth edition of the of the Nabucco Award. Uh, so we hope to, uh, with the funding that we now have, to uh, continue it for two more years and then try to uh, to renew it. Uh, if you are a faculty member, uh, this is uh, a great uh, uh, award to keep in mind to recommend to your students this year and in, in future years. So. I want, of course, to congratulate the two winners. Um, and also, I want to thank the uh, two people who have agreed to introduce them. And uh, so Sarah Rook will introduce uh, RJ Hayes, and that Professor Carta Bailey will introduce uh, Micah McGee. So uh, in the interest of time, I will let uh, Sarah take over. So I'm back up here again. Um, so um, RJ uh, was an undergrad student in the Latin American Studies major, so I got to know him well um, during his, his time with us, and um, I served as his academic advisor. He had an area of concentration of social justice with an emphasis on Portuguese-speaking countries, and he's actually continuing a similar focus right now in his master's program here in Portuguese um, at UW-Madison. He actually just started last month in the program, so um, it's exciting that he's already applied and you know won this award, and um, so that's fabulous. Um, he's originally from Milwaukee, and I thought this was kind of a fun fact. Um, during high school, he actually went and spent a year in Hungary, so completely unrelated to, to this talk today, but um, he uh, had developed his fluency in Hungarian language, and a kind of a little you know, anecdote when he came in for the first time to see me for advising, that kind of came up because I asked him about his background and what he was thinking about doing in the future and he said he had studied Hungarian. I said, seriously, I'm like, there is an advisor down the hall who is the advisor for European Studies Certificate. He's Hungarian, you should go talk to him. So RJ was very excited and so was Chanad, the, the advisor down the hall that they could practice their Hungarian and meet one another. So. Um, Let's see here. So during his first year here at UW, he participated in a FIG, which is a first year interest group program. Um, he took a contemporary Brazilian society course. And um, he had explained to me that it was his first real exposure to Portuguese and Brazilian studies, and that he instantly became enamored with both the language and the culture. Um, he gave, gave special thanks to his FIG instructors, Mara Loveman, Jackie Lopez, and Florencia Malone. Um, later on, he was awarded a FLOSS Award from Lassies, uh, to, which is a foreign language and area studies fellowship to spend a, an academic year studying in Brazil. Okay, I'm going to try to, I practiced earlier with Israel, so he spent a year studying anthropology and sociology in Belo Horizonte at the Federal University of Minas Gerais. I don't speak Portuguese, so forgive me. Um, and then, let's see, today he will be presenting his talk for us, the World Cup for Who, Race, Class, and the Destruction of Flavelas in Brazil. So thank you.
Well, thank you, everyone, for coming. I'm very honored to be here right now. I did come to these talks when I was um, a freshman here, and I saw some of my colleagues, such as Nick and Ian and uh, Gizo, give their talks. And it was very inspirational, and I always dreamed of being up here to be able to give one my own. So I'm very honored. So thank you, Sarah, for that lovely introduction. And thank you for all the guidance that you gave me as my counselor and advisor during my undergraduate years. And uh, thank you to the Brazil Initiative, Lassies, and the members of this year's Nabucco Award Committee for making this opportunity possible. Thank you to all the students that are here right now. It's really wonderful to see so many faces as well. And um, like Sarah mentioned, thank you to my, um, all my professors, especially um, Florencia Malin, Jackie Lopez, and Mara Loveman for introducing me in my very first semester of freshman year um, that Brazilian studies and Portuguese could be so interesting and wonderful and engaging. So, um, and lastly, thank you to my professors who encouraged me once, twice, maybe three times a week that applications were due by May 9th. I really needed that, so thank you. Um, so a little bit about why I decided to write about this topic, um, the World Cup. Well, obviously, the World Cup, as we all know, happened um, this June and July. Um, and so it's, you know, it's in the public eye right now. And like Sarah mentioned, I got to study abroad in Belo Horizonte. And during the end of my stay is when the protests against the World Cup started to happen. And I was, like she mentioned, I was in the sociology and anthropology department. So I was kind of hanging out with the people who were really, really involved in the anti-protest um, or in the anti-World Cup protests. So I kind of didn't have a choice to <laughs> be involved in the subject, at least discussions around it, and sometimes even going to the protest, which was a very eye-opening experience. So um, I'm very excited to be presenting on it today. So without further ado, I'd like to present my paper, um, A Copa para Kang, Raça, Classe e a Destruição das Favelas no Brasil, or The World Cup for Whom, Race, Class, and the Destruction of Favelas in Brazil. So. Um, so when people think of Brazil, obviously, they think of like, very stereotyp stereotypical images, such as you know, beaches, tropical tourism, samba, um, saudades, like the nostalgic feeling of Brazil, happiness, and of course, soccer or futebol. And so kind of all the stars, all the stars kind of point to Brazil being the perfect host country for a World Cup. And also, the Brazilian soccer team is worth mentioning because they are currently the um, world leaders with the most titles as champions, with five titles, right behind Italy and Germany with four titles. Um, and they are the only team in the world to have participated in every World Cup since the start of it. Um, they hosted it in 1950 as well, which was pretty significant because it was the first World Cup after World War II. There was a 12-year gap without any World Cups. France had hosted it in 1938, and then Brazil later on in 1950. Other teams thought about putting, placing in bids European teams, but shockingly, they decided to use their money towards other things after the World War. So, um, so as Brazil prepares for this World, or as they prepared for this World Cup, um, sorry, I wrote this paper before the World Cup, so I might slip up a couple times. Um, so, as Brazil prepared for the World Cup, um, they had to get a couple things in order, make a few changes. Um, and some of these changes included advancements in security and their infrastructure. Um, and then these big changes took place, obviously, in the host cities of the World Cup, such as Belo Horizonte, Fortaleza, Sao Paulo, Rio, Manaus, and Recife in Brasilia. I'm, I think I'm forgetting some of them. But um, so as they make these changes, articles in the news and government officials and people on the street are talking about these limpezas or cleanings to purify the streets. And when they're talking about this purification, they're not talking about the cleaning up the litter on the street. They're talking about people, families, students, professors who live in the more dangerous areas in Brazil. Um, so I kind of wanted to ask, what are, the, what, are the limit, what are the limits of these purifications? Who is affected? How are, how are they done? Um, the, the plans of the Brazilian government affected, have affected, and will continue to affect many families um, because of the changes that they're making in preparation for the World Cup, or that they were making. Um, so they're taking a lot of measurements to 
they're going, they're taking a lot of steps to eliminate violence. They're going, um, they're taking all measures. Um, and in order to do this, the police and the government are going into favelas and kind of taking families and relocating is the word that they're using, is relocating them and kicking them out of their, out of their homes to create space for highways, new stadiums, hotels, and these sorts of things, and to clean up violence. Um, and they're doing this to prepare for the tourists that were coming to stay for the duration of the World Cup, which was a couple weeks long. So my other question is, why are they not helping out the people who are living in poverty? Instead, they're just kicking them out uh, to make room for people who are only coming for a couple of weeks. So um, like I mentioned before, um, the, or Brazil hosted the World Cup in 1950, which was significant because it was right after the World, right after the world War. Um, numbers were completely different. Uh, Sao Paulo had a population of 2.4 million people in 1950. And for those of you familiar with Brazil, the population of Sao Paulo right now is anywhere between 20 million to 40 million people. So those numbers in themselves are very significant because um, it kind of talks about the different types of preparation that the that Brazil had to make in order to prepare for the World Cup. Um, so overpopulation wasn't, wasn't the deal back then. That's not what they were looking at. It was trying to, take, trying to make a very successful event after a very heavy, um, hard time period, which was World War II. Um, so this year's World Cup is looking at that overpopulation aspect of it and um, the historically uh, dangerous favelas that came with the overpopulation. Um, and so for this reason, favelas are sort of glowing in the public, public eye right now. So as urban cities grew in the past um, in Brazil, they sort of grew um, parallel with industrialization. So cities were growing because people were moving from the countryside to the city and there were a lot of jobs being offered. Um, so with a higher demand for jobs, there was more migrations to larger cities. Um, but then it sort of hit a wall and the supply of jobs decreased as the population continued to grow, and therefore favelas grew. Um, and favel these favelas that I'm talking about, or slums, if you aren't familiar with the term favela, um, have always had bad connotations, as the word slum normally does in, in English as well. Um, books and publications and lawmakers have used words to describe favelas such as dirty, criminal, violent, poor. Um, and since favelas often lay on the outskirts of major cities, um, many upper class and middle class Brazilians are able to kind of go about their day to day routine without having to um, worry about the numbers of poverty and bad conditions in the, in the favelas. But then when the World Cup was approaching, all of a sudden people started caring. But they weren't caring, they weren't caring as much about the people inside of the favelas and fixing the bad conditions they wanted to get rid of it and clean it, clean it up. They felt a little bit threatened. And so um, violence um, kind of plays into this threat that they, they felt. When they, when they feel threatened by the favelas, they feel threatened by violence. Um, but violence and racial inequality are not issues that began because of the World Cup. Um, they've kind of been around for forever. Um, since the beginning of Brazil. So what I mean is that Brazil, or violence in Brazil has um, been around ever since the Portuguese colonization. Um, for centuries, Portuguese colonizers and, Braz and Brazilians used other um, Brazilians and African slaves and indigenous people to, to help the, to make the country grow and to cultivate the land and to um, develop. And they didn't do this in the nicest way possible. Um, obviously, there's a lot of violence and discrimination and repression that happened as a form of working conditions and punishment. And Brazil was actually the last country in the Western Hemisphere to abolish slavery in 1888. Um, so uh, this, the concept of violence towards these darker-skinned Brazilians and African um, Brazilians kind of stuck around over the years in Brazil. Um, let's see. Sorry, I lost my spot. Um, so then those beautiful, happy, nostalgic images of Brazil is kind of taken down a couple notches when violence and racial um, politics come into the discussion. Um, so race in Brazil is sort of this gray area that I unfortunately do not have enough time to get into today. But what I do want to mention about it is that there are 
many Brazilians who say that race just doesn't exist in Brazil, um, and that there are no preconceived notions about race because of the variety of skin colors, that it's hard to define white, black, because of the, the large variety of skin colors. And this inability to define race makes many people um, blind to the inequalities that darker-skinned Brazilians face every day. Um, and generally, it's the lighter-skinned Brazilians who are the ones to say these things, um, because they, like I mentioned before, they are able to sort of walk around with a privileged lens. Um, and th so then these criminal violent representations of the favelas continue to be associated with darker-skinned um, Brazilians. Um, and then, so kind of shifting gears a little bit, um, I also talked about in my paper the, all the coverage that this, uh, relo the relocation of families and the violence is getting in, in the international sphere. Um, so with about, the numbers are saying about 15,000 families are being relocated because of the um, World Cup and the Olympic Games that are coming up in 2016 in Rio. Um, so this has been brought to the international attention, obviously. Um, two distinct sides have been represented in the news, whether to host the World Cup or not. Um, the issue of public investments, where the money is going, is, has been sort of the, like, the catalyst to get the protests going. Um, people are afraid that all the public money is going into soccer stadiums and not into um, education, health, um, and transportation and standards of living. So um, it really brought a lot of people out to the streets. I'm not sure if, me, if me, any of you watched the news last year around June, but it was um, in the international news. My poor mother was calling me all the time, being like, are you OK? I'm seeing such bad things on, on the internet. <laughs> um, like the one year she decides to be updated in the current events, seriously. <laughs> but um, so this. This news coverage has been a motivation for Brazilians to take to the streets, and um, they're seeing that their problems are real and that people care about them, um, especially in other parts of the world. Um, and they cover lots of different issues, so, such as they, t they inform the rest of the world how these purification efforts are being taken out and the violence that's being used. The violence that's being used to eliminate violence, which I think is an interesting concept. Um, and so it also talks about where the money's going, where it's not going, where it should be going. Um, and it's also shedding some, lights, or some light on the next steps that Brazilians are taking um, with the way that they were sort of walked over in this situation. Um, the communities are, communities are learning to organize better. Um, more leaders are popping up and creating plans of actions and goals on how to better their communities and how to demand their rights. Um, and Something else that I thought was very interesting was that some Brazilians actually were renting out their houses during the World Cup. This is kind of showing that, uh, to tourists, to European tourists, this is showing that they um, found the means and the um, accommodations to host people and to actually make some money off of it. So um, the media is becoming a very important tool for Brazilians um, who are trying to make some structural changes in Brazil surrounding topics such as race, um, class, and World Cup renovations. And I want to honor my colleague's time, Micah, so I will stop there. But if you want to keep talking about it, I'll be at Bachi Papu on Thursday. Bachi Papu. <laughs> <laughs> um, but thank you all very much. Before I let uh, Professor Bailey uh, have the stage, uh, I, I forgot to say at the beginning that uh, for people to please save your questions to people for the end. Uh, so we'll proceed uh, now with the introduction of uh, my communication by uh, Professor Katja Bailens, uh, who is a professor of Spanish, and uh, my colleague from the, from the department, and who has uh, been uh, who has uh, been very kind in agreeing to introduce Maika. Well, it is <coughs> with uh, indeed a great pleasure that uh, I came here to introduce uh, Micah, and I'm very happy that he's one of the winners of this competition. I have got to know Micah in a couple of graduate classes, where he invariably impressed me with uh, uh, his work. He impressed me with the insightfulness of his readings, with um, the clarity of his uh, interpretations, but 
especially with his ideas. Now, Micah has been one of those graduate students who are the greatest pleasure to work with because they are invariably bringing fresh ideas and as a result we can learn from. Um, it was during the introduction, the graduate introduction to cultural studies a couple of years ago where I realized that uh, I and Micah share certain important conviction, namely that literature should not only be analyzed for its own sake, but that it should deal, deal with real problems of the world. So as a member of Micah committee, I have uh, been excited to find out that he decided to work on the subject of trash someone uh, more and more drawn towards environmental studies, I see trash as a very important issue of the future world. Uh, in fact, I believe that trash is our future environment. And for many people in this world, trash is already their environment. So uh, we now understand that trash cannot be simply trashed, cannot be washed away, cannot be removed. Uh, we need to learn how to deal with it. We need to learn how to live with it. And for these reasons, trash deserves a good thought. That's why Micah's work is not only cool and original, but it's deeply relevant. Um, in words of Micah, he researches trash um, how trash works in different contexts, what it says about different social structures and arrangement, and how it helps us to think about crisis. Micah earned his BA in Spanish from Truman State University in 2004, MA in translation from University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee in 2007, due to that his enormous sensitivity to language, and his MA in Spanish from UW Madison. Um, recently, he passed with honors his preliminary examination at which I was present. It was one of the best prelims that I have witnessed and that we have witnessed recently in the department. And he has become an ABD. In general terms, he is interested in Latin American narrative prose, focusing apart from trash on themes of marginalization, violence, transgression, and subversions in contemporary novels and maybe films. <laughs> and right, the title of his essay that he's going to present today is Deus Salve America, Ignacio de Loyola Brandao Zero and the Production of Trash. Thank you. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Katja, for those uh, exceedingly kind words. Um, I would also certainly like to thank the Brazil Initiative and specifically the Joaquim Nabucco Award Committee for um, selecting my essay for this great honor. It was a really pleasant surprise um, for a, uh, someone who is very new to Brazil and Brazilian studies and the study of Brazilian literature to um, be honored in this way. And I would also uh, like to thank very heartily uh, Ms. Vivi Nabuku for providing very generously the material support for this award. Um, and uh, before I get into it, uh, first I guess I won't be <coughs> as charismatic as RJ was and e extemporaneously present anything. I'm going to do the very typical academic thing and read my, my paper, a very condensed version of it. Um, and just so you know what I'm doing with the PowerPoint, uh, I'm not super confident with reading quotes in Portuguese to all of you. Uh, so I'll be, I'm going to read them in Portuguese, um, the quotes from the novel, and I'll uh, project them up here on the screen so you can read them. And there'll be an English translation as well for those of you who would rather read the English translation. Um, and the translation is mine. Uh, there is an English translation of Brandao's novel. It's a 1974 novel written by Ignacio uh, G. Loyola Brandao, uh, journalist and, and author of some fame from Brazil. Uh, the English translation is by Ellen Watson. The translations on the PowerPoint slides, though, are my own um, because I didn't have the English translation in front of me. 
Uh, and I'm imagining not everyone is familiar with this novel, and I'm not going to be able to give you a, a very detailed summary of it right now in the interest of time. Um, but I will say that it is um, a, a novel definitely worth reading. Uh, it was written um, in the early part of, or late part of the 60s and early part of the 70s uh, by Brandao, who was a...